Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Fashion people. Let's stand up. <laughs> I want you guys to stand up. I want to make sure you're awake. Stand up. <laughs> Good afternoon. afternoon. How is everyone? Good. Do I need to make sure you're awake so we need to do a game or something or is everyone awake? We're awake. Are we awake? Are we together? Yes. Thank you for joining our session. Have a seat. I'd like to introduce my good friends and panelists for today. I'll start with Marvin Kirago of, Shep's, of um, the CEO of Shop Zetu. So as he comes up, I'll let him also introduce himself and tell you a bit more about himself. Marvin, welcome. Let's give him a round of applause. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Marvin Kirago. I am the co-founder and CEO of Shop Zetu. Uh, I hope every one of you shops online. If you have, you've probably bought an item on Shop Z2. Uh, we're Kenya's leading fashion marketplace. Uh, we currently have about 300 brands and 25,000 products on live on the platform. Uh, we're looking to grow, so I know there's a lot of vendors here, so please uh, come to our booth, sign up, and uh, let's get more customers online. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, a round of applause for Marvin. Then we'll have um, designer Olga Nato. Welcome, Olga. Good afternoon. My name is Olga Olga Nato, fashion designer, fashion PR. I also write. So we can have a conversation after this. I help tell um, designer stories on my platform. Thank you. Finally, a round of applause for Akinyi Odongo, O.G.W. And she'll, ex she'll explain what that is. Welcome, Akinyi. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Akinyo Dongo, OGW of your heart. I am a fashion designer and I'm also in different sectors in the fashion industry. I own a fashion school called Mepha Institute of Design where we offer diploma and certificates in fashion and design. We have a fashion school for kids called Wanawatindo where we nurture young talents and uh, a high brand fashion brand called Akinyo Dongo Kenya. And also very passionate about the fashion industry. I'm the founder of the first pioneer and founder of Kenya Fashion Council and also Fashion Agenda Africa, which I'm here to represent where I nurture and mentor young designers across Africa. We have been able to mentor across over 5,000 designers across Africa. Thank you. Thank you. Round of applause for our panelists. So how we'll conduct this session is I will ask the panelists a few questions. And then I will open it up to the audience, um, and then we'll pass a, a mic around. I think Fred or someone will help me, and we'll also get in your questions, all right? So, um, Olga, we'll start with you. In terms of sustainability, um, because SDG and sustainability is really a buzzword and really happening in Kenya, what within your business are you doing to support sustainability? So I will start with my story probably. Yes. Because I think um, the best version would be what I can tell yes. the most. Yeah. I lost my mom at the age of nine. She left plenty of clothes. I only have one sister. So what I practiced then, I realized this was something so sustainable on my side because then I was able to resize her clothes to fit me then. And now what do I do with that yes. currently in my business? Um, I can have a collection and after two or so years, I find this collection probably did not move as much or the remains of the collection. I'll try and twist. I'll have them redesigned, resized. Yes. And so that is one of the ways that I use. I also have formed a model where, because I do a lot of gowns, yeah. so my clients can trade in their gowns after wearing, oh, and they get to pick something that is more practical to them, or I resell on their behalf. 
So you're saying that if I had a wedding in January, yes. um, the gown that you made for me, yeah. I can bring it back to Organato. Right. So do I sell it to you or just explain how would that work for a wedding gown? So we'll have a conversation. Okay. One, would, is this something you'd wish to keep? And now in a more practical way, then we can redesign it. Okay. Yeah. So then you can use it for a dinner or for a different occasion. Okay. Or two, I can resell it on your behalf. Okay, all right. Right? Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Or you can give it back to me okay. and you pick a piece that works for you. So then I get to re-own it. Okay. So yeah. I, so I can either give it back to you and then you can style it into something else. Exactly. Or I, can, or I can give it back to you and then I can get another piece. Exactly. So that is sustainability according to how you I practice it. Yeah. Practice it. Yes. So I want to move from sustainability a bit to Marvin um, at Shopzetu. Congratulations, because um, earlier this year, Shopzetu the mini um, launched the Shopzetu Mini app in partnership with Safaricom. Will this technology be a game changer for the fashion industry and e-commerce in general in Kenya? Um, yes. So I think everyone knows Safaricom. Safaricom has the largest customer base in the country, yes. right? Yeah. Um, there's no business that exists without customers, True. right? Um, so if you're a fashion designer, um, how do you access 50 million customers in Kenya? Right now, there's no platform, no, there's right? No platform, uh, yeah. You know, if you open a shop in Moy Avenue, all you're getting is the food traffic that's passing there every day. Yeah. Um, so the reason why we partnered with Safaricom was, you know, the Mpesa app is an app that's used by pretty much every Kenyan. True. Um, and we want to give the brands that are on our platform access to the you know tens of millions of customers on, on the app. So I think what we will be doing by partnering with Safaricom is giving a, you know a platform that allows um, the brands to access um, vendors and sell them. So I think it's part of you know the mission of growing fashion locally. Right now on Shop Zetu platform, how many vendors do you have? Uh, we have 302 as of today. What is your target? 100,000 across Africa. <laughs> I think it would be interesting to know if there's anyone in the crowd who's a Shop Zetu vendor. Is there uh, anyone here on Shop Zetu? Oh, great. I've seen a couple of uh, vendors. How many? I see one. Any more vendors? Okay, I'm sure they're good. So your target is to get to how many? 100,000 across Sub Saharan Africa. Across Sub Saharan Africa. By when? Uh, next 10 years. Great. Okay. But we'll get to 500 by the end of this year. 500 by the end of this year. Okay, we're on to support you. So, Miss Akinyi Odongo, OGW, I will continue to stress that, <laughs> as you corrected me. Um, maybe tell us a bit about your journey in fashion, because I know you also have um, your Fashion Agenda Africa organization. Um, what is it? Tell us a bit about it, and how is it impacting the, and pushing the fashion industry currently? Thank you for the question. Uh, my journey is quite long in the fashion industry. I don't think we are able to finish it today. <laughs> uh -huh. But um, I was brought up in a small village called Rangala in Sierra County. And yeah. That's where I schooled, that's where I was brought up, and that's where I grew up. So I came to town by default. <laughs> yes. okay. um, so my journey has been quite uh, an interesting one. Where you, and I think it's every young designer has experienced that where you start your own brand. Uh, either when you've gone to a training or you haven't gone to a training school, but then when you start, I think when you start getting into the space, you find that it's quite um, uh, it's quite interesting, and, and I think every designer can attest to that. Where you find that there's already existing, if you come in, you find already existing clicks yes. that are working together. So as a young designer, you find that you cannot fit into the click or you have to create your own click, and then creating that own click then it doesn't really work. So you, you're very frustrated as a young designer and wondering what to do. You could apply for um, events or fashion shows, but then you can't qualify that they don't know you or you don't... So you're it's new to the game. It's very, very frustrating. So uh, in, it's been a long journey, you know, just traveling that path. And at some point, I did challenge myself that every problem that I've faced in life, then I have to create a solution for it. So being a designer, a young designer coming into a space where there are already existing designers and people already there, and then you're not able to really fit in, but you have to create your own space. 
um, the journey was quite interesting and painful at the same time. So I felt that for the challenges I've been able to face, what are the solutions that I'm able to, to create? And that's where Fashion Agenda Africa was formed, where then I started reaching out to young designers across Africa who reach out to me and say, okay, you're successful, can you be my mentor, can you, be, can you guide me? And I felt, you know what, it's really uh, a good thing so that then the pain I've gone through, nobody else should go through it. Yeah. And then being, if you look at our slogan, is lighting the other person's candle. And I think uh, in Africa, one of the things that we do is that we have, um, I would say, uh, uh, a scarcity mentality sometimes, that you think when you share information with another person, they're gonna be beyond you or past you. But I do believe that when we have many candles lit, then we have a very big room that is very well lit to the number of candles that are lit. So I went on to the journey of just holding hands of very many brands and uh, I can say uh, the first cohort is about 48 brands wow. who are now big brands in Kenya and across Africa and I can attest they are doing a great job. So by lifting the other person doesn't take away from you but can only make you become a better person. Um, and out of that experience, again, it made me feel it's, it's a bit, because it was young designers across Africa and those were just getting in and said, like, why don't we do something bigger for the Kenyan, uh, for Kenya? And then yes. that was where I think Connie was there when you were starting the Fashion Council. Yes. And it was a challenge thrown to us. And yeah. I had to step up and raise my hand and say, yes, I'm going <laughs> to try and take, take it, this on. And take yeah. it on. And many designers who've been there, uh, who have been there before us and, and those who are within, were able to come together and create a Fashion Council that was able to do a lot of work you know, in this country. And through that, um, the, uh, the government has been able to recognize, you know, what was being done and a lot is now happening due to that, you know, cohesion and working together. Now, on the, on the question of a, of a new entrant coming into the fashion industry, we don't have a database of where we can find designers. You know, at least, um, you know, shops, these are vendors who can be found, but for a new guest who's flying into Kenya for three days, what do you think we can do to create a space, or a, I don't know, is it a database? What do you think we can do as an industry to create a database where you can find designers listed in Kenya? Because we don't have that. Um, I think, as I mentioned earlier, collaboration, collaboration, collaboration. Yeah. And that is the biggest challenge that we have in this industry, and even as Africa as a whole, and also in Kenya. Where if I met NATO, then you think NATO is a competitor. Yeah. Yet, there are so many things I can do with NATO that I can test, you know, uh, yeah. that there are things we've done together. Yeah. And I see a number of designers in this room that I've been yeah. able to work with together and not as competitors, but people that we can collaborate. Yeah. I think if we shed off that slide, you know, we remove that veil of me, myself, and I, and work with other people, we would be able to go a, a long way. And um, if you just look at even the fashion agenda Africa right now, the cohort too that you're yes. starting to run, yeah. and these are young designers who, you know, they've not been in the industry for quite a long time. And of course, I've got the experience and I've got information that they can be able to benefit from. And it's important to let them, you know, lead from, from, from the front. Yeah. I wasn't here when this function was up. I just arrived today from the yeah. Belgrade. Yeah. And the stand was there. The young designers were able to put up things on their own. Yeah. They are able to interact with other people. And that's the space that we'd like to create because yeah. I'm not going to be here forever. Yeah. So it's, it's upon us as designers, and especially the ones who've been there before, to create space for others. Because if you don't create space, then there's a clog. Even if you don't, you know, if you don't drink water and clean up the pipe, then you're going to have a clog. I don't want to have a clog, but to create a space that others can be able to pass through and take this thing to the next. So, quick question. So, where is your stand? Because I'm sure there might be some people here. Uh, the stand is there, Fashion Agenda Africa, and I okay. think the leader is also seated somewhere here. Brenda, where is okay. Brenda? Brenda is there, she's the okay. leader of Fashion Agenda Africa. Okay. And I think a number of them who are here have been running it, and it's purely going to be run. It's being run by the young designers so okay. that they can have their own space. Right. Yeah. Okay. And also with that, we're creating a shop where they're able to also come together, uh, network, we have space on, on Moringa Road that they can come and interact with each yeah. other. Yeah where they can just be able to, you know, don't die on your own. After COVID, you know, there's a depression, there's so much, we are all struggling. Yeah. And sometimes you think that you're the one, the only one struggling. So I've been able to create that space for the younger designers, not just in Kenya, but across nine African countries right now. Great. And just the one, one more, in terms of how, what are the criteria for someone to be part of this fashion agenda program? A new designer, what is the criteria you look at for? Uh, 
first of all, because we're looking at sustainable businesses and we're looking into growing businesses to the next level, you must be a registered business. And even if you're not, we'll be able to guide you on how to do it. And you're going to pay 5,000 Kenya shillings per year for you to be part of that, uh, of that group. So the ones who've been able to enjoy the opportunity, they're the ones who pay the 5,000 shillings per year. Uh, because we've done this before for free of charge and sometimes people don't take free things seriously. So there's a small fee of 5,000 shillings that one has to pay to be part of that network and they'll be able to enjoy the opportunities that are available. Okay, thank you. Um, now to back to you. Um, in your opinion, Kenyan designers uh, currently, are they conversant with sustainability? Do they understand? Are they practicing it? Because you also deal with a lot of designers. So, um, I'll say all that we need to is to change our attitude towards this because Sustainable fashion has been pictured as some sort of luxury that if you're doing something probably of uh, not as competitive, you think that you don't, you don't fit in. I think that all we need to do is have a little bit of change in attitude. First, we need to allow ourselves to know um, get to know where the fabrics are made, what uh, the composition of the fabrics, um, do their effects on us and their effects on environment. All I think is we need to have, educate ourselves about this and then just change our attitude. I know not so many designers are practicing it and it's just because it's not a topic that we talk about every time and when we talk about it we talk about it like something that is untouchable or unreachable yeah so in terms of spreading the word about sustainability um, especially for designers who are here right what are key things they can do within their businesses right now that it's a no-brainer that you can just tell them at least within your business, you can be doing point one, two, and three, you know, quick things that they can do. Honestly, I can think of a million things yeah. uh, just to, like, simple practices. Uh, one, reduce your waste, um, your waste, have waste management pro program. One, um, they say about 16% of the things, the fabric that we cut go to waste the 16% that you throw down. Example, what I'm wearing, this was a waste. So this was meant to go out. And then you can pick this and use it as a detail to something new. So then this that could have gone to waste, you keep it, you reuse it on a different uh, fabric. Um, our packaging, we can also have to check on that, that instead of using some harsh ones we can i use pepper and so if you can start and practice using pepper as your packaging i think that would be another no-brainer um we can also not get to throw away stuff like um, having fabrics or having clothes that we feel they've been in store for some time we can practice either giving them, donating them to the less fortunate, visit children homes, or give them at a, um, a discounted prices to other people so that we get to have them in the market. Yeah. Thanks, Marvin. I'm gonna come back to you in terms of brands on shops there too. What are the key things you look for when, um, you know, I'm sure the brands here would be interested to know. What do you look for when you, uh, Amanda wants to be, you know, what are the key things that they need to have? Um, so we're, we're not very particular in terms of like a certain style or design yeah. because you know we're serving every Kenyan and, and you know as you can diverse imagine tastes. you know diverse tastes the, the black t-shirt you like and the one I like are very different yeah. um, so we want all brands to be on the platform because yeah. we're serving pretty much every Kenyan. Um, that said um, you know and there's no upfront cost as well. So we don't charge a brand to be on the platform. Um, what we don't accept on the platform is fakes. So we're not going to take a brand that is sort of doing, um, you know, fakes of our brand or someone else's course, brand yeah. Uh, yeah. because we're, we're supporting brands. Our platform is to grow um, local brands and so we don't want to dilute brands by adding on fakes. Okay. 
And in terms of um, menswear, how, how big is the menswear section? Because I know when I'm as a stylist, when I'm looking for men's clothes, there is not as many what we brands in Kenya as opposed to the female brands. Um, the menswear is tricky. Um, currently, men's is about 10% of, of what we sell. And even that 10% is actually bought by, most of it is bought by women for their men. For their, for their men, interesting, uh, yeah. And I think men generally don't shop as often for, for fashion, and I'm you know, uh, guilty of this as well. Um, but we're trying to avoid more and more um, men brands, we're trying to market to more men. Yeah. Um, I think it's a category that's going to grow over time. Uh, but, but right now, I think you know, women fashion is, is, is sort of the largest category. And do you have a lot of shoe brands? Um, yes, we, we have some of the larger ones. Yeah. Uh, City Walk, Mojarava, who are like the largest um, players. And then we have a couple of like niche um, shoe brands on the platform. And accessories? Uh, a lot of accessories. A lot of accessories. Yeah. So those, would you say those are faster moving? Because accessories is a, is it faster moving than a clothing brand? Because sometimes maybe it's returns. How do you deal with returns also? I'm sure people would want to know, right? Um, oh, I mean, we, that, in theory, yes, accessories would, should move faster. Yeah. But we've seen more traction with actually women's wear, particularly you know, items like dresses. Oh, dresses, dresses are the, yeah. you know, the um, best sellers on the platform. Um, in terms of returns, we have a seven day return policy um, just because it's fashion, you know, sizing, taste, preferences, and we want to make sure that anyone who has any concerns should be able to you know, take that first chance and and buy the item and not be concerned that they won't be able to return it. Because, yeah. you know, trust is the biggest barrier True. for online shopping. Yeah. Great, thanks. Um, okay, I'm going to come back to you. In the last 10 years, how old is your brand right now? How old is the Kenya Dongo brand? It has transitioned to many, you know, from <laughs> Mepha yeah. you know. Oh yes, from <laughs> Mepha, oh my God, I even forgot about yeah, that, yeah. yeah. So, right now it's been about 20, 21 years now. 21 years. Yeah. Amazing. What has been some of the significant milestones in your brand? Because I'm sure it's evolved, as even the name has changed. Yeah. yeah. A lot has evolved. Yeah. Um, when I started the business, I was the jack of all. I was everything. I was the accountant, uh, messenger, tailor. <laughs> I was doing social with, media. Social media. media. There was no social media even then as much, you know. Yeah. So uh, I was doing everything myself. So every aspect of the business, I really understand how it works. Yeah. Um, as, as Mepha Creations, a sole proprietor, and then as I grew, I realized that, you know, uh, for me to do business in certain levels, then I need to have a limited company as opposed to a uh, sole proprietorship uh, kind of a business, which then it transitions to um, Mepha Art Center, uh, which then is a place to create different aspects of art. Um, after about 15, 12 years, I felt that I needed to go a notch higher and to go international. So I started to do a lot of research locally and internationally going for exhibitions and just understanding how do the big brands work, how do they operate, and how does it take to take your brand to the next level. Um, I did a lot of mistakes. I remember going for some exhibitions like this and I carry a whole suitcase of so many things and you spread everything all everywhere. I'm like, no, that's not how it's done. So what's wrong with carrying everything? What's, is, there a, is there a strategy yes, when you come to exhibitions like this? Yes, there's, there's a, a huge difference. You have to understand, is it, is it a selling fair? Is it a, a marketing fair? Uh, you need to understand what is it, what is it all about. Uh, like the one I'm just from was a, was a museum, and I just went to showcase my pieces. I wasn't selling. So it's to, to, to just let people, the clients get to see what you have that they can order. Uh, the mistake I did with my first one, I think that was in Cape Town, and another one in, in New York. I carried a whole suitcase full of so many things, sandals, bags, handkerchiefs, <laughs> anything, anything, everything. I can then I hang, my store was so full. And you know, all these foreigners come and look at yourself and they're like, it's too much. What's going on here, you know? And then you see other brands who are very high level, they only have like six, four pieces, nicely hung, and they're like, you're not selling. I'm like, why are you here? <laughs> you're not selling. <laughs> Then you realize they're just showcasing their either their next collection or then they're looking for buyers to buy. And then you think, oh, I like this, I want 10,000 pieces, I love this, and then you go and now order. So those are some of the things that I've been able to learn as, as I grow. And even changing the name. Uh, as I traveled, I want, people use their native names, so why can't I use mine? 
I was more of Iblin Nodonga, I was like, Iblin, you called me a king, I'll beat you up. But, and I realized, hey, it's I have treasure. Oh, it's unique, I have treasure here. So even going out there, the quality service, yes, and now I'm changing my name into, into a brand, because there's no offense to it, and I think as Africans, we are very scared of using our own names, and even talking our language and, and doing that, which um, even looking into transitioning to even have explanation of my brand in my native language, Luo, so that you can have transcript to, 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 to read what it means. <laughs> so I, I learned that there's so much that we have that we can take to the next level, and uh, it has been a journey. And uh, one has to really look at what is your target market, what is your... Don't copy-paste, because there's also that issue. People just copy-paste, oh, Akiji does trench coats. I think she's making a lot of money. Let me do the trench coats as well and use the same fabric. We lack, and I like what you just said, yeah. that you don't want to have brands that are copied. Yeah. And that's something that I've, I've experienced, and it's, a, it's an issue that uh, in, in another capacity, you're trying to see with the government how we can be able to really see how do we uh, protect our creatives work by people not just copying and, and pasting and, and carrying other people's brands as their own. Because yeah. uh, it's a huge problem in, in, in Kenya and a huge problem out there, so hopefully soon, there'll be a caveat to that. So it's, it's, a, it's a process, it's a long process. It's been a whole journey of mistakes, okay. learning and unlearning. I would say, what's the most important lesson you've learned so far about running a business as a designer and a creative entrepreneur? Uh, the greatest lesson I've learned out of the mistakes that I've made is take everything you do seriously. However small your business is, even if it's a little corner, one of my first shop was, I couldn't think I knew you know my first shop, it was it behind was, a chemist. It was like, like the area you're sitting in. Yeah, yeah. literally this square. This was but it was very smart and clear. Yeah. <laughs> so whatever you do in whatever level, just take it as serious as it deserves. Don't, don't look at it as something that is not very important. Uh, everybody who comes to your store or people who follow you up, they're actually looking at what you do, they follow you. The biggest lesson I have learned that there are clients who will watch you for 10 years, 15 years, and buy from you after 20 years. They will never buy from you in the past three, four years. And they'll be your biggest customer. So keep at it, focus, do the right thing, and, you know, work with, 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 the, the, with the right organization that you need to do. If it's your product, get the caps. I think they're here, Hippie is here, yeah, keep is here, about the Kippy. That's why I get my trademark. They're here. Just walk there and let them, let them do their Kenya checkers or can see everybody, all the organizations that I've worked with that have really uh, helped me grow my, my brand. And another thing is, don't wait until you have the money. The money is in your hand, is in your hand, in your, in your brain, in your, you know, network, network with people. And don't be afraid to try. I've, I've dared to dream. And I've never been afraid. Very true. Thank you. So Nato, I want to move on to technology. Um, we all know, know now there's 3D, there's AI. I mean, it's, it's all really big right now. Uh, how, do you, how ready do you think East Africa is for this kind of technology, even in production? Do you think we're ready? Kenya, do we have any of these things? Honestly, I think they should be put more out because yeah. if I want that today as a designer, I do not know which doors to knock. That's true, yeah. Yeah, so I would wish to have this like a, a whole different session for the rest of the creatives to be aware that if they want to take their creatives in this platform, which are the doors to knock and where are these people? Right. Still on technology, um, Marvin, let me come to you. In terms of AI, it has really gained traction and it's expected to take over the fashion industry. Is this a good thing or a threat for fashion in Kenya with AI? Um, I think generally all technology is good technology because it, it allows human beings to scale exponentially. Um, you know, when you think about when the internet started, yeah. everyone was afraid that the internet would take over people's jobs, but yeah. it ended up creating even more jobs and, and productivity and, and the like. So no, I, I think it, it's, a, it's a good thing. We should embrace it. Um, and in fashion particularly, it has a lot of very exciting use cases. Um, I can speak for Shop Z2. Yeah, to be like, uh, yes, Shop Z2, you know, using this, yeah. Uh, so a couple of things. I think the most exciting use case for us is having a personal shopper. Mm -hmm. um, so when you think of Shop Z2 as a platform, right now we have 25,000 products. You, you know, by the end of this year, we're trying to get to 100,000 products. 
you, if you're coming to look for an item on, on the website, it can actually get overwhelming. Yeah. Right? And, and so what AI is doing, especially this sort of new development around uh, gen you know, generational AI, is that it, you can actually have very hyper-personalized recommendations. So we're already building um, an AI engine that will provide customers with hyper-personalization. You get recommendations for exactly what you're looking for based on you know, your past um, shopping um, like, you know, types, sizes. So, so, they, like so for example, what if I'm someone who comes and likes to wear car dresses? So AI has my information. So that, that we already have, actually. We already so have that so we, we already do that, even so, without AI. So how would AI now help me as a person who likes Ankara dresses? Um, so it, it's not just Ankara. It's, you know, AI looks at data around, say, you know, I shopped for Ankara, and I paired Ankara with a certain um, shoe. So then when you come to buy your trench Ankara, you will get the recommendation for that because we've seen that in the past there's a pattern. So it's all about like identifying all these patterns and, and it's analyzing millions of data points. So last year we had 1.7 million visitors to the website. That's a lot of data. We know what people are looking at and not buying, you know, buying, um, you know, if you're shopping for maternity dresses, you can sort of already tell, you know, someone who's potentially, you know, um, going to give back. So there's a lot of data that just needs to be crunched to be able to provide people with um, hyper personalization for shopping. So that's, you know, one of the use cases uh, that we're excited about. Right. So, so as we're embracing the AI, we're all still also able to embrace people's jobs. Are people's jobs going to be affected, like within ShopSet, because of AI? Or is, are they enhanced, or how does it work? I think what happens with technology is it allows people to be more productive and to scale themselves, right? So, um, I'll give you an example of another use case that we're exploring. Um, with AI now, you can create virtual models, so we're already doing that. Um, so, you know, right now, for every item that we list on Shopzetu, we need to get a physical model to shoot in each individual item. So you can imagine it's very expensive, right? And, and I also don't think it's particularly creative work. So it's not the best kind of model work that I would necessarily encourage anyone to do. We've had to do it because that's what was available. With AI, I can use um, technology to have virtual models wearing the, 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 the clothes on the website. Then I can create more jobs for models on creative content, which is where you can express your creativity, your style, um, so, you know, I, I feel like people will end up doing more productive work yeah. that allows them to, to unleash their creativity as opposed to like sort of monotonous website pages. Thanks, thank you. I think at this point I'd like to open um, questions to the floor. If anyone has questions, I think we can have a robot mic. Maybe Fred can help us if anyone has questions or someone. Um, and we'll pass the mics around. You can ask any of our panelists questions. Um, Hello, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Pioneer. I'm from Delight Fashion School. My question goes to um, OGW, Lady Akini. Um, how long did it take you to actually establish yourself? I know we are learning fashion entrepreneurship, but during your startup period, how long did it take you to feel, yeah, I'm now established, I'm now in the market? Because you started with doing everything, taking care of everything, but how long How long did it take you to feel, okay, now I feel I'm in the business, I'm starting to make money? Do you have any more questions? Maybe just take a few and then the answer at once. No? Please go ahead. How long did it take me? <laughs> um, I would say it took me about seven years, seven years to know that now I have some money. <laughs> uh, first, you know, when you're starting your business, you're working for, first I started from home, so I was using one of my kids' bedroom to, to teach and to do everything. And then, of course, clients would come home, go fit in the, in the toilet, 
those of you who are like me, relate. And then they come out and go back, stitch overnight. Um, but then I didn't have uh, any structures as much. So I felt I needed to challenge myself to move out of the house and now run it as a serious business. And then I got to, it was called Natukot then, just opposite Natukot Prestige. I got, there was a chemist there that I was submitted behind. So I think that's where Connie met me first many years ago. And she featured when I felt I preached. <laughs> so uh, with that, I started now to take my business very seriously, where I save, um, I used to have a target of saving. If I am making um, 10,000 shillings, then I put 2,000 shillings aside and, and, and save into the bank account. I had one tailor, because I've now grown, I was doing better, I had one tailor. Um, and my, my first office was a little, I say little corner, so I had a cutting and my tailor was behind me. When Roy moves, I could feel it, and then Roy is too happy to go, you know. Uh, so it, it, it's, it's determination and really seeing where do you really want to go and where do you want to, to move. Um, but then after that, I moved from the small little shop to another shop within the same company. I was now paying from paying 12,000 shillings to paying about 28,000 shillings. And I added another office in the same place, additional of some more money. Uh, I, as I told you earlier, I love challenges. So the moment I get comfortable, I get the next challenge. And then I moved out from a uh, space where I was paying those, but then I went to another place where I was paying over 100,000 a month. <laughs> so just kicking myself and, you know, just going, how far can I go and how far can I stretch? Um, started the training, the school, and right now, um, quite something and uh, I'm hopeful that this is um, an encouragement to anybody else who is starting that it's doable it's possible and I was very intentional in doing my BSA but, uh, looking at passion as a business not as a, as a hobby and I must testify that the car I drive the house I stay in everything I do is based is purely from the passion business that I have. the office that we have at Akinyo Jungle Kenya it's an office that I bought and paying a mortgage out of the business that I'm doing. It's not easy, but I'm just here to share and say it's possible it can be done. So nothing is impossible with God as well. Before we get another question from the floor, um, Nato, maybe you can also ask the, answer that question. For you, how, yeah, when did you realize that now the business has picked up? I also have a question for Akini. So oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, ask Akini the question, then you can answer. <laughs> um, Akini, I have a question because um, I also get to handle a lot of young designers. I get um, them attached uh, at my place. But I also wanted to ask on fashion agenda. What are some of the benefits that these young designers get from me yeah. or from signing up? to be the fashion agenda? The benefits are quite many, and I would uh, request that all of you go there. We have a flyer that has all the benefits listed. And uh, being in the fashion space for those so many years, I've made lots of networks. Um, I'm, I'm well-traveled. I've been able to face a lot of challenges in the space, and I've got solutions for some of those, uh, those challenges. So you being part of Fashion Agenda Africa, you are destined to actually see that it's possible to cross over and uh, we'll be able to hold your hand as you move. And the system that we use is, a, is, is the, the affiliate we call us, the, I call them affiliates. The affiliates are able to, to, to be accountable amongst themselves. Because I, I also don't spoon feed. Uh, if someone would come and say, I think I can, you'll have all the time with me and give me all the ideas, no. By you being part of uh, this group, you'll be able to find solutions. Uh, we have a snazzy card that you're, as a member, you have a card, which then will be able to give you an opportunity to work with the people that have been able to partner with and get discounts, um, things like this, and many other events that we are organizing. Um, initially, we had Fashion and Taxes. We're the first organization to do Fashion and Taxes in Kenya, uh, put a manufacturing and, and designers uh, networking program that we did some years ago. Uh, so we create all that because the networks have been able to create, I felt, I don't want to die with all the information I have. It's just important that whatever I've learned and whatever I have, I'll be able to share. And sometimes just throwing them out there without a structure, 
then it doesn't mean so for it to have a legacy and have a structure as you mentor young leaders are to be all their own leaders and to be their own uh, people moving ahead. I think that's the best way to do it, where they own, they themselves create their own solutions for the problems they have. That they have a question, they have access to me, uh, that I'm able to hold them and have their hands. Right now, I think I've just met a young model somewhere here. She saw me and just came and told me, Akini, I'm supposed to do this, I have stuck somewhere. I've been able to just make a call at the ministry and she, her case is sorted just here. So, so those are some of the things that I'm like, you know what? You don't have to carry everything for yourself. Light another person's candle because when we are all lit here, the room becomes brighter than just one candle. Yeah, thank you. I hope that to any other person who had the same question that has been answered. Um, on my story, <laughs> I think, Connie, you remember where I've met? So, uh, I started equally from a room first I did move out of home and I didn't want my family to know what I was doing because I didn't study fashion I studied um, PR and communication so I didn't want my fa family to know because when I tried telling them that this is what I wanted to do no one agreed so I moved out of home I got some small SQ elsewhere in Kilimani, and then it had um, a balcony. I started there with one tailor, and this tailor would just do my own clothes. And so I modeled this to my friends, to my church mates, and I got back home, and my friends started supporting me. From there, I think I moved to Hallingham Plaza, also a very small room. Uh, it was, it was 8,000 a month. At this point, I had not told my family um, clearly that I had resigned from my work and I was doing something. The moment I told my family that I had resigned and I had started a business, and in their own mind, they were looking at it as tailoring. They didn't understand how anyone can leave a proper paying job and start a tailoring and in something, you know, just didn't make sense to my family what I was doing. So my brothers tried to convince me that if you need to go back to school, we can support you and you know you go and do your masters. Because at the time I was actually coming back from abroad, and and my drive was because I'd seen this out there that owning your own culture and. Uh, being authentically you was something more important than wearing the stuff that we were wearing out. So coming back home, I had that drive. I wanted really to do something that made me feel like I'll be seen as an African, as a Kenyan, and that I did not get to disappear before people. So my family did not have the same vision as what I was feeling and what I was having. I thought to myself that this would take me to the next step. And for sure, it took me some time. My family kept dragging me back when they knew that. My dad kept calling me, do you even have rent? Are you eating? And uh, I made it as this will be, and that's what kept me going. I said, I would never want to go back home that I failed. But better still, I thought to myself, if I fail, I have a home to go back to because I didn't have any responsibility other than myself. So what pushed me was the courage and that that I didn't want to fail. Right. So from there, I, I also don't settle. I have never been comfortable. Every time, and even when I was starting, I started getting calls and talking to different people. I started getting invites abroad. Sometimes, um, some of my friends here would ask me, when you go to showcase, do you get paid or how do you, how do you make your money? Everything that I would have made here, I'll use it as I travel. I'll carry, do, go do my runways and when I'll be back, I'll have no money, but I'll not tell anyone. I'll start again and push and for sure, you continue to write your story because you never know who is watching. And like Akini said, like 
someone can wash you for years before they get to come to you. But once they come to you, um, it's a different story. So my story has been a story of consistency. Thank you. Do we have any more questions? There's a question, there's a question there. Yeah, okay. We'll get the two and then we can. Yeah. Hello, my name is Kava Tamasi Grace with BTR TV Kenya and we are the main media for this event and we also focus on uh, fashion events. So my question to you is how can we partner or collaborate in bringing such events and spreading awareness to not only Kenyans but worldwide because this is such a beautiful event and it's happening for the first time here in Kenya so how can we collaborate and spread awareness? Shop Zetu, our, our e-commerce model is, is basically content commerce. Um, so we're always looking to create content, we're looking to partner with people who are creating content for fashion. Uh, so our doors are open, we'd love to partner, we'd love to see how we can work to do um, more events, work with more creators, work with more fashion brands to get the stories out there, get the Made in Kenya, Made in Africa story um, to go you know, regional and local. Um, for the second question, uh, that's actually against the contract. Um, uh, we, it, you know, at the beginning it was very manual to sort of identify the pricing mismatches, but, you know, with technology now we're very good at identifying those instances when they happen. We basically have, a, it, it's automated now. Uh, we do run scripts that can tell if you're pricing differently and we then get the brands to, to match um, the prices because you know, at the same time that we're looking at the interests of the, the, the brands, we also have to make sure that the customers are getting value for, for their products and they don't feel like they're getting scammed on the platform. So, uh, after this, maybe you can give me the names of, of the brands that you're seeing. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Marvin. Um, I think as we wind up, are there any more questions that we can wind up? I don't think there are any, any more. Okay, so, oh, there's one more there and then I'll take part in shots from you of our panelists. So if you can have a mic that can move to her, please. Hello. Uh, my name is Makena. Um, I'm from way back in your end. used to be a lecturer there. So my question is, Transitioning from employment to starting, what are some of the financial principles that you need to apply? Because sometimes it gets tricky, especially now that I've come to know that the profit that you make is not like your money. <laughs> so what are some of the things that you can advise for somebody who's in business? And um, matters, would you, would you advise um, on taking on loans when you're starting now that maybe you've been in, a, in your own comfort, maybe you're starting out in your house, but now you need a bigger space where maybe clients need to come in and do all that. What is your advice on that? Um, if you don't have to take a loan, don't. Yeah, because you're trying to grow your brand 
and then you'll be trying to pay back the loan. So if you don't have to, please don't. If you have to, know all the pros and the cons before you get into that. Um, again, as you transition, right, from employment to doing your own business, I, I will say I sacrificed a lot. I did because remember, as I mentioned that I was even hiding. I didn't tell my family that I started doing this business behind them. So honestly, everything that I was doing, I would reinvest it back. I didn't have my own money. I just didn't count that that was my money. Um, reinvest, check on ways on how to go about it and put your money back until you feel you are in a very comfortable uh, place where you can start earning from your business. Maybe a king you can add. What do you need the loan for? Is it necessary? Anyway, uh, what I would advise is whatever you uh, mentioned earlier, whatever you do, do it seriously that it deserves. Um, especially for the young designers, the mistakes that I made uh, when you're doing costings, don't do costings for purposes of, sh of short changing the other designer because those are the mistakes that we do. You're, sometimes you're charging the other part, you're doing something almost similar but you want to charge it lesser then you realize you're not making any profit and you run out of money. Um, save, bank, bank, bank your money. You're better off having zero balance but you've been banking that money. You'd rather bank it then we throw it to God buy material. Bank it, we throw it to God buy because your the bank what the bank will not eventually look at is your what are your transactions in your account. Sometimes you assume you want only to bank uh, when you have a lot of money when you bank. If it's a thousand shillings you've earned today, go bank it, withdraw it tomorrow morning to go and buy the fabric. That will create for you history that the banks will be able to see that you're bankable and you're there, able to even give you a loan with that time comes. So start building slowly from an early age, an early stage, so that you're disciplined and pay yourself. Pay yourself. I didn't pay myself, but pay yourself first before you pay anybody else. Even if it's a salary of 5,000 shillings that you allocate, I'm going to pay myself 5,000 shillings every month or 10,000 shillings every month. Pay yourself and pay the rest. Thank you. Can I, can I also add on to that? Um, collaborations because as a designer you also need to market your collections so collaborate make friends with photographers makeup artists models so that you can have a thing where every three months you do a photo shoot you butter trade you know that you're able to give the photographer clothes or something model gets clothes but then you're able to also have great pictures to market your products online because those are also very expensive by the time you have photographer makeup artist that's a cost and as a small business, you can't manage that. So you want to form collaborations where you're able to do butter trades and everyone is benefiting. And you have great pictures to market on your you know, various platforms. Market, make money, make more money. It's a cycle. You have to be smart about how you bring income into your business and how you're selling yourself. Just um, yes. <laughs> a point on that, it calls for a lot of self-discipline yeah. and self-respect. When you're going to call on another brand to work with, you have to respect um, their values. I have had a lot of uh, issues with people who come to me for collaboration, and then they don't follow the same value or they don't uphold uh, the same values that they say they have. So values, uh, for you to grow as a respectful someone in the industry, please, just ensure you have your own values and respect to other designers as you or any other person that you intend to collaborate with, whether it's a photographer, makeup artist. If they say you have to tag them, yeah. please do. If you have to return their stuff after a particular time, two hours or one hour, please do. If there's any change, communicate. Um, I think just to wrap it up these you know now with technology the the bar has been lowered anyone can can start a brand affordably um so i would say also leverage technology uh, you you don't have to be alone you don't have to struggle to acquire customers everyone is online on social media um they're on the different platforms they're on shops there too 
partner with people who have platforms and can give your brand a platform to access customers. That makes it easier for you to start and grow your business. Thanks. I, uh, thank you. i just like the panelists to say their final words before we close. Um, Akinyi, we'll start with you. My final words are, it's possible, it's doable. Uh, we have got what it takes, especially as Africans, where the world is moving. Uh, it's an opportunity to step up and take responsibility of everything that you do. Because everything that is moving around the world right now goes back to the African culture. So take advantage of that and move forward. And collaborate, collaborate, collaborate. Photographers, stylists, you can also join Fashion Agenda Africa because within that network you'll be able to um, network with other brands. And as Konya said, collaborate. It's very easy because then you're collaborating with people that you'll be able to know in a particular network. Thank you. Um, I'll say you don't have to do it all alone. Um, you don't have to start a business as a young designer. Please, there are some of the good stuff, like I'll say, um, there are some of the pain I went through because I started it all alone. I did not get to learn a few more stuff. Uh, work under someone, even if you're just serving them tea. That's a network that can help you another day. The fact that you've worked under Kini, you'll be very different from someone who is just walking in to know them uh, from no no point of reference. Work under someone, learn one or two things so that when you are going to do this on your own, you know some of the uh, laws and highs of uh, starting a business. Thank you. Uh, I would encourage all of the designers and brands here, uh, don't be afraid of uh, being online, digital, uh, it is the future, embrace technology, um, you will be able to access more customers um, very affordably and you can grow your businesses to scale. So partner, go online and, uh, and use all the resources that are available to you. Um, thank you, I think from my part I'll say um, consistency. Be consistent. Fashion is a great industry to be in but you have to be consistent and put in the time. It's a very glamorous industry, but you need to put in the time. So that's it from me. Thank you, Akinyi, OGW, <laughs> Nato, Marvin. Thank you thank very you much. Welcome. Thank you very much, and thank you to our audience, and all the best. <laughs>